So I'd like now I'd like to welcome Sarah Thompson, who's the first to speak with us. Well, thank you. And, and what a lovely speech. I just uh, I don't know whether I can talk that because everything that you taught you touched on is something that, that I believe in. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. At 16, I started pumping gas. By the time I was 18, I started my first company. At 24, I was recognized as top dealer in Canada. And by the time I was 30, I built a multi-million dollar company, turning around failing service stations and making them successful. I was the, one of the first to bring the store content into the gas station industry. I'm running for mayor because I'm, I'm fed up with City Hall. I'm fed up with politicians who say there's nothing wrong. I want to make bring change into the city. I want to bring um, diversity into the city. I want to open our doors and, and welcome the people back into the role of guiding our civic government. The symbol to my campaign is a key that I wear. It's a key to opening up these doors, to welcoming the city with all our ideas, all our needs, all our wants back into that role of guiding our civic government. So on October 25th, I hope you'll support me to become Mayor of Toronto. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so there are four different themes that we're touching on, uh, and I, I said I'll be asking each candidate the same question, um, and then the floor will be open to you. Now, as you know, the province of Ontario is in the process of implementing five accessibility standards under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. Although only the customer service standard has been passed from the law, as of this date, these new requirements are going to significantly impact the way in which organizations operate and deliver services to the public. With Toronto being the sixth largest public sector organization in the country, this city is in a position to become a role model and leader on issues of accessibility and inclusion. Now, above and beyond the legal accessibility requirements, what will you do to create a culture of inclusion within the city of Toronto staff? and its agencies, boards, and commissions, for example, the TTC, the services, fire services, and the number of other services the city, the city provides? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, when I look at this, I think, okay, what areas, how can we change? First of all, we have to change the culture. We have to make accessibility the first and foremost priority and diversity. Welcome that change in. We need ideas. We need to understand how important those ideas are for all of us, everyone that we have in our city. So that, that's the first thing that we have to address. And that comes from leadership. True leadership saying, I want change. This is my vision for, for Toronto. This is what I want to see. And this is what I want to bring. So it starts with the leadership. Then, how do you actually go about implementing it? And it all comes down to planning. I've said, I want to consult the public first. Let's bring them in. Let's open up the doors. And before we do any planning, we consult everybody involved. And, and we get their input. So that comes to, it includes accessibility, that includes the diverse, um, and, uh, what do I want to say, groups and organizations. So we invite them in, in all planning areas. And we have some major issues where, you know, you've got, right now you've got the subway stations, and the subway stations aren't fully accessible, the um, elevators break down, the entire planning around it is completely irresponsible. And what I'm saying we need to do is start thinking first, we're, we're now putting in emergency exits instead of making them fully accessible. That is wrong on so many levels. We're going to make some changes and, and, and um, re, re, what's the word I want? Uh, reorganize the, the subway stations. We need to be making them fully accessible as well. That's where we've got to think of things like ramps and, and other ways we can get around when the elevators are broken. So that's an area where I believe we have to approach planning. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask that uh, people wait until the end of the conversation and then we'll get more for questions. So, moving on to budget, which is a two minutes, I think. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we have two minutes. Thanks. How are we doing tonight? Uh, 20 seconds. Okay, in that case, I'm going to move on. <laughs> uh, obviously, one of the biggest topics in this election is budget. In light of recent economic challenges and rising in areas, many of you have made spending on part of your platforms 
Often it is the most vulnerable members of our society who are the first to be hit by budget cuts and those with disabilities are often among the most vulnerable of the low income population. How will you, as mayor, ensure that people with disabilities are protected when budgets are developed and implemented? And please be specific in your examples. Okay, now this is where um, being a mother of two children, being somebody who really is running because I care about this city, uh, this is where being a woman actually, I believe, does make a difference. I, run, I want to run the city like a well-run household. In other words, we care for those in need and we balance our books properly. So what I've said is we need to balance our books, we need to get some costs down. We have a, a middle bureaucracy that is costing us a lot. The front lines are being heard by the management. There's a lot of savings there. There's a 6% attrition um, a rate at City Hall, and I think we need to take that and make an opportunity of it. I think there's a lot of money there that can't be saved. And that money I want to put into um, issues around accessibility, issues around uh, fair, equitable hiring. There's so many things that we're not approaching, and we're not making a priority. And for me, it's about making a priority. So when it comes to the city buildings, for example, why not make them, say, polling stations? And we get the federal government in, we get the provincial government in. And we say, you know what, these, we're going to make these areas polling stations. You know what happens when you do that? They have to be fully accessible. The province and the feds come in, they help us pay for that. So that's one example where you have to just kind of think outside the box a little and say, how can we make what we want to happen? How can we implement that? and make it really happen. So that's an area where I would work on. But really it's about making the, the, the decision to lead on accessibility issues, making that decision in every single department, planning, um, uh, budget, every single department we have to lead with that vision. And that's the vision I bring to the table. And, and it's because I believe we have to listen to what the people want and build a city government that the people want. We have to lead our government instead of not engaging, instead of backing out and letting our politicians run things and not getting what we want. So it's about engagement. I'm going to ask every single one of you to help me when I go, when I get into power because I think it's so important that that has to be shared and what the people of Toronto want has to be brought to the table. Thank you. Now, people with disabilities, as we have acknowledged, make up about 15% of Canada's population. And we've also talked about the fact that that will increase over time as our population increases. Now, Canadians with disabilities are more than twice as likely to live in poverty than other Canadians. This reality means that the disabled often experience great difficulty in securing and maintaining safe and affordable, affordable housing. The most recent data available indicates that there are 5,454 households with special needs on the waiting list for affordable housing in Florida, and it can take a number of years to get housing through this process. It was recently announced by the province that it's a $185 million group that's rental opportunity fund for our families program was not being used to its full extent and that it is being restructured to give municipalities flexibility to allocate rent supplements to best meet their needs. Toronto showed that the reallocated money is a projected to be $21.6 million. Now what portion of this $21.6 million will you as a mayor make available to ensure accessible and or supportive housing for people with physical, developmental, and mental health disabilities, and how will you do this? Well, I think we have to shoot high, so the percentage would then be 20%. You have to shoot high and aim for that, and that to me is extremely important. Now, I've talked about restructuring Toronto community housing, and the reason for that is they aren't a good landlord, and they're, they're spreading themselves too thin. They're getting into key care components that they're not doing a good job with when it comes to that. So what I'm looking at is, let's restructure Toronto community housing, get them to focus on being a good landlord, let's get them to get rid of the bedrock problem we have in Toronto. And then let's look at how can we bring in our nonprofit organizations to provide those key care components we need. I've also talked about a portable rental subsidy. So we give these subsidies so that people have choice because what's happening is a lot of um, those that are, are low income are having to go into high priority neighborhoods. I don't believe we should be doing that. I think what we need to do is spread them out, have them interact more within all the communities. So a, a portable rental subsidy allows people to choose where they want to live. It allows us to, to spread them out across the neighborhoods. If you look at something like the St. Lawrence uh, market area, there's uh, Jane Jacobs created that. Her idea is 10% low income. We have that mix, and we use mixed use fixed income kind of zoning. So we allow that mixed income, but we also allow the mixed use. So you, you know, the dry cleaners are there, the schools there, and we've got residential in the same area. And that's the only thing that's worked. 
but we're not copying it. I say, if something works, copy it. Do it again and again and again all over Toronto. And that's my, my vision. I want to see more of that all over Toronto and, and, and less of these high priority neighborhoods that have developed where we shove our poor into one area and that's it. And we, we, then we have to deal with crime and everything else that comes up with that. So for me, we, we spread it out and we work together in all communities to create a better um, quality of life for all. According to a recently released City of Toronto report, 6.4% of Torontonians without disabilities participated in a registered City of Toronto Parks, Forestry and Recreation program in 2005. And the same year, the percentage of Torontonians with disabilities who participated was only 0.4%. Now obviously we're referring to swim programs, skating programs, and community programs that all of us uh, see happening, particularly over the last several months. Despite the large body of research that shows the many benefits of recreation for people with disabilities, it seems that the city's programs are not attracting this community and may not actually be accessible. How will you ensure that parks, forestry, and recreation comes out with a realistic and economically viable plan to ensure that people with disabilities have equal access to recreational programs in their neighborhoods and do not have to travel long distances or encounter limited selection of programs that can't accommodate their needs? That was, that was a great question. Um, I've, I've talked, I released this week, I released my, my operating budget plan. And what it does is it, it reduces costs when it comes to that 6% attrition rate. It looks at paying down our debt, which is at $3 billion and costing us $430 million a year to finance. I've looked at that and I've said, we can, we can lower that. Let's pay off our debt. Let's sell the empty lots we've got. Let's sell the maintenance yards we're not using. Let's pay down our debt. Once we do that, it brings our costs down. And I've said, you know, we need to put $50 million per year starting in 2013, $50 million per year into our rec centers so we can do this, so that we can make them fully accessible, so that we can create programs um, that do that. So I, I've put on the, on, the, on the slate that we need to put more money into this. And this is why, and as well as the seniors programs as well, and daycare programs, we don't have enough money there. I've come up with a, a, a viable strategy to getting the money there. And I think that's what's key. At the end of the day, it's about funding. I think when you go up to the, the public and you say, you know, what do you want to do? I'm hearing they want to support um, equity programs. They want to support the diversity programs. They want to support accessibility programs. The whole issue comes down to money. And when it comes, when it, 